thousand songs. And it goes right in my pocket. Failure of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. Welcome to Future Square, the podcast all about innovation in the enterprise, brought to you and run by Collective Campus, an innovation hub based in Australia that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies and tools to successfully explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. For more information, go to www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared, everyone. Today, I'll be bringing you Rand Fishkin, who uses the ludicrous title, The Wizard of Moz. He's the founder and former CEO of one of the world's fastest growing software companies, Moz, an online marketing platform. He's a board member at presentation software startup, Heiku Deck, co-author of a pair of books on SEO and a co-founder of Inkbound.org. Rand's an unsavable addict of all things content, search, and social on the web, from his multiple blogs to Twitter, Google+, Facebook, LinkedIn, and a shared Instagram account. In his minuscule spare time, he likes to gallivant around the world with Geraldine, his wife, and then read about it in her superbly enjoyable travel blog. Today, Moz is worth more than $120 million, and I'll be exploring how the software can be used by corporate teams to help them grow market share. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rand Fishkin. Welcome to the show, Rand. Oh, thanks for having me, Steve. You know, it's an absolute pleasure, and you're joining us all the way from sunny Seattle, Washington? <laughs> it's, you know, it's only raining a little today, so <laughs> I think it, it could be qualified as sunny. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and being from Seattle, I take it you're a huge uh, Seahawks fan. I, I am. The Seahawks are one of my favorite teams. I'm actually a, uh, a Green Bay Packers fan of all Oh, teams. okay. How did, how did that come about? Well, because I'm a socialist, and uh, uh, the Green Bay Packers are owned by the town, and I think that's how all sports should be. You know, the, the citizens of a town should get to own their own team. Mm. I think that's, uh, yeah, that'd be my goal. Yeah, that's an interesting interesting point, and I, I could go on about the German Bundesliga and how the teams are all owned by the fans and how that yeah. generates the biggest audiences in all of, you know, soccer, as you guys call it. So. It's an interesting yeah. thing, and ticket prices stay low. You don't have this whole, as um, Roy Keane, famous Manchester United captain, used to say, you know, the prawn sandwich eaters at Manchester United um, occupying most of the seats. He used to say, and it was a funny, funny story because the chef of the, the head chef at Man United basically said, "Well, we don't actually sell prawn sandwiches." He got really offended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is the problem. You've got all these billionaires who own sports teams, and it's like, yeah, I, I want to cheer for you, but. Mm. Uh, it's not really hometown pride. It's more like let taxpayers build you a stadium so your team's worth more. Yeah. I don't know if you really need that. Mm. Anyway, so mm. Green Bay Packers. Green Bay Packers. Cool. Awesome. Um, and you're a big Scotch fan. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Cool. So In fact, you might have noticed, I don't, I don't know if you can see, your viewers can't see, but I'm wearing a uh, Whiskey Made Me Do It t-shirt today. Awesome. Love it. Love it. <laughs> um, so what's the last drop of whiskey you had? Let's see. I was in. Ooh, I went to a uh, a Japanese restaurant uh, last week, and I had some of the Nika coffee whiskey uh -huh. that they make. Um, I think it's. I can't remember if it's Hibiki or Suntory. It's one of those guys, and that's oh, terrific. that's like my favorite whiskey, man. Eighteen year old. I think it's eighteen or seventeen year old Hibiki whiskey from Suntory. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I, the Japanese have done some amazing things in Scotch. Yeah. Uh, I will say my favorite is actually from your neck of the woods. I love that uh, Tasmanian Sullivan's Cove. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, my God. They they make an extraordinary whiskey. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good drop. It is a good drop. Hey, while you're there, man, I may get you to stand up. I'll take a screenshot of your T-shirt for, uh, for the podcast. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Sure. Yeah, no problem. All right. Cool. Done. Cheers, man. All right, so let's, let's get into it. So it's... um. Before we, before we go into it, it's probably worthwhile advising our audience um, on what Moz actually does for, for a pre predominantly, I suppose, our corporate audience who may be unfamiliar with your product. Um, do you want to just give us a quick sort of 30-second spiel? Sure, yeah. So Moz really does two things. We are uh, a huge community and educational resource, uh, and the vast majority of that is free to help people learn and understand how search engines work, uh, how search engine marketing, and specifically SEO, the organic non-paid side of search engine marketing works. And then we also have a suite of tools and products to help professional search engine optimization folks mm -hmm. do their job better. Uh, and that includes a few products around 
uh, you know, monitoring your website and choosing the right keywords and uh, discovering who links to you and who links to your competition, right. uh, helping your local small business get all the listings they need, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, and you were the uh, CEO of Moz, obviously a founder of Moz from, well, you were the CEO from 27 to 2013, and now you're an individual contributor helping the company scale. So what does your role actually look like at the moment, Rand? Yeah, uh, so it's it's not... Not massively different from the seven years when I was CEO. I, I have to do a lot less uh, management. I get to do uh, a lot less with uh, with finance and, mm -hmm. and with investor relations, but uh, I still do a lot on the evangelism and the marketing front. Uh, I work with a couple of our product and engineering teams here, and mm -hmm. I sort of serve folks all over the company as a resource whenever I can be helpful um, so, on all sorts of issues. So, so basically what I'm hearing is you do all the fun stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I do a lot more of the fun stuff and a lot less of the uh, stuff I didn't love to do. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, and on marketing, you know, it's changed quite a bit in the past ten to fifteen years or so from that traditional above the line machine gun marketing, if you will, to that what's a little bit more targeted or sniper rifle marketing today. Uh, but only that we're seeing that, you know, once upon a time product, build a product, marketing would go out and, and scream from the treetops, whereas today marketing plays a very active role in that early stage where they're helping to test product market fit and test those key assumptions underlying a business model. Um, do you want to perhaps expand on that? What, are you, what have your experiences been in that space, particularly with Moz? Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree that the best companies, especially the best early stage companies, are doing a good job of this, right? They're involving uh, their customers in the development of their products. Mm -hmm. They're doing that early in a life cycle. They're releasing things early, sometimes even in private, uh, and testing them. And then they're seeing what resonates uh, in the market as well. And I think marketing is learning that kind of, you know, lean startup iterative approach to building a campaign uh, and finding which areas have traction for their message and which audiences and influencers are receptive to those messages. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would certainly agree that that, that is a, a best practice today. I might argue that it's not very commonly done or not very commonly done well. Uh, mm. And it's hard. It's very hard to execute on. I think you know, many times there are still uh, companies of all shapes and sizes that want to build a product and then have a you know, group of marketers go shout from the rooftops mm -hmm. and attract customers. And that, that is far less successful than involving customers and evangelists and influencers early building something they love and want to support and see do great things and then having this built-in community uh, to go help spread the word. Yeah, and would you, would you say that um, it's not done well or companies aren't investing too much time or money into doing it because it falls in the, the too hard basket and there's no sort of short-term ROI, it's not something you can track in say three months, it may take 12 months for that type of thing to pay off. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. It's this form of marketing, especially this idea of building a brand and building a community, uh, you know, serving evangelists, investing in things like content strategy and content marketing and SEO. These are long-term payoffs that are very hard to measure, not just in the long run, in the short run, but in the long term too. Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them mm -hmm. don't have easy metrics that you can tie to them. You might say, "Well, we're going to measure content success by overall traffic." Right. But Overall traffic might not be the best metric, and if you try and measure it by number of conversions that came from uh, content visits, that's an incomplete picture as well, right? It's going to miss a lot of the nuance. Yeah. Um, and the same is true for social media marketing. It's true for community building and influencer marketing. A lot of those channels are very serendipitous in nature. Yeah, and I think that's one of the challenges, I mean, especially even for us here in our organization, we create a lot of content, but there may be seven or eight other touch points along the way. Um, there could be meetings, there could be phone calls, they may read a blog, they may listen to a podcast, they may hear from a, a colleague of theirs that they came along to one of our workshops, and so that kind of starts to build that trust and, and um, credibility, but it's a lot of these things coming together. It's not like it was just one blog that got that customer over the line. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely the case. And I think in a multi-channel uh, marketing world, measurement has gone from... Uh, 
you know, especially web marketing measurement has gone from so incredibly trackable, which it really was in the early days of the web, right? You could track every visit that came from search to which page. Mm. Uh, you knew which keyword sent the traffic there. You could track every ad that you bought, every social network, uh, every single campaign down to the visit. And I think that built up a culture of metrics and measurement in the mind of web marketers. Yeah. And now yeah. that we have this broader experience where we have multiple channels that are involved in a visit and needing to attribute those and uh, mm. you know having these serendipitous forms where it's offline and online combined, there are, there are a lot of marketers who have trouble measuring it. Yeah. And I think yeah. more seriously, there are a lot of CMOs and managers and executive teams and investors who have a challenge justifying those investments. And because of that, you, you see a lot of folks not stepping up to the plate. Mm. And have you seen any examples of companies doing this well in terms of measuring it? And if so, what does that look like? Yeah, I, I have seen a few examples. Um, I think that the folks who measure it the best use some of the classic offline measurement capabilities. Basically, hey, we invested in associating our brand with uh, you know, this particular trend or mm -hmm. this form of content or this topic, uh, this movement, and what have we seen as a result in terms of brand lift? What, how many people are aware of us now that weren't aware of us before? Right. How many people say that they are, uh, that if they were considering a product in our space that we would be, you know, in the top three consideration set? Um, what have our sales done in geographic areas where we've promoted this campaign heavily versus those where we haven't invested in it? Mm. And you know, make, if we make sure that the demographics of the population in those two geos are similar, we can then see the ROI of that investment made over time. Right. Uh, this is, there's no doubt it's challenging and there, are, there is both an art and a science to it, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be done. I think the question, the question for a lot of early stage folks, though, that, that's tough is, mm -hmm. is it worth it? Is it worth measuring or do you have to take some leaps of faith? Yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those interesting ones where if you're a an early stage startup, do you kind of a, a, try and attack ten different customer segments and hope that you get you know one customer segment putting their hand up, or do you just try and go really hard after one segment and put your all your eggs in that one basket, um, which may mean that you'd have a better marketing strategy, your sales message, your marketing message, ad copy would be um, better geared to that market, but maybe they're the wrong market, so it's kind of like a catch twenty two. It's, that's a challenge for sure. And then I think the other thing is, you know, especially either at an early stage company or inside a large company, but where you have limited time and budget to meet your, you know, ROI demands and the, and the needs of your management, uh, you can get drawn into this path where you're spending 40% of your time trying to measure what you're doing with, you know, 30 mm. or 40% of your time. And that is not necessarily an equation for success, right? If you could shrink yeah. that down to, hey, we're not. We're going to be much less perfect and exacting in our measurement, but we're going to be able to do a lot more of the work. Mm. Um, that that is compelling too. Yeah, and it comes back to that different perspective and the way you look at things. And um, on large companies and large organizations, um, say with tens of thousands of employees, um, do you see any doing a good job in this area, or do you think it's still very much the domain of your early stage startups? No, no, no. I, I certainly see, I mean, a ton of big brands, especially in the consumer field, mm -hmm. have notably invested in uh, content and content marketing, in social media marketing, in SEO. Uh, you know, everyone from uh, TripAdvisor to Expedia to mm -hmm. Zillow to, you know, all, all the all the major uh, players in the content world where, where um, search is a huge driver of transactions, Airbnb being a good example, mm. you know, they are all investing very, very heavily in content search and social, and they're tying those channels together well. Uh, so this is happening at very large scale companies and, and big organizations with thousands or tens of thousands of employees. Yeah. But, you know, it is, it's also a huge opportunity for many startups who are trying to disrupt or trying to end around, um, I, what I would say are fields where the investment has been much lower, right? So mm, mm. Uh, outside of places where content leads directly to transaction. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And um, I know you mentioned a few companies there, TripAdvisor, Expedia, Airbnb, I guess today's 
large company. Um, but what about some of your more traditional organizations, like your GEs of the world, Procter & Gamble, um, companies with 100 plus year history? Do you yeah. think that, it's, that they need to be doing this type of thing? And if so, do you see evidence of companies of that ilk doing it? Yeah, um, I mean, a, a very, very old, well, uh, at least, you know, one of the brands is extremely old, uh, Diageo, right, which owns mm -hmm. like Guinness, for example. Yeah. They, they've been doing content marketing since the 1800s. I mean, the Guinness Book of World Records is a, is a content marketing ploy, right? Like, let yeah. me put this Book of World Records into all these bars and restaurants and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. have people refer back to it and settle bar disputes and also think about Guinness as they're doing that. Um, so I... And they've obviously made a tremendous amount of investments. I think, again, that's a place where uh, those, you know, the content is a little closer to the transaction, at least from the brand level. Mm. And so it makes a ton of sense. But yes, so P&G has done that with a number of their brands. I think they've been particularly passionate about the social media space. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we've seen, uh, uh, was it LVMH, right? A bunch of the brands under Louis Vuitton, Moet, Hennessy. Uh, making investments in that kind of space as well. So, uh, yes, it, it happens with big companies, old companies, and with newer, start, you know, somebody like an Airbnb or a Zillow, uh, they do it too. Yeah, that makes sense. And, um, I mean, on content, you know, I read a report which found that companies that blog, say, 16 times a month generate up to four times more leads um, than, than those that post only four times a month. Um, so it seems like there's an, an absolute, almost a direct correlation between the content going out and the leads coming in, um, of course. I, mean, I would be careful, though, right? Yeah. I, I think this is one of those where correlation is not causation. Yes, so goes back to what we were talking very, about earlier. Yeah, right? Like, it mm. could very well be the case that the publishers who are most successful with their content marketing are also the ones who are doubling and tripling down on it. Mm. But that doesn't mean that in every space, in every vertical, content is the best, the only, or the thing that you should do, or, or even that you know, uh, the right thing to do, even if you've determined that content is valuable, is mm. to publish as much of it as you possibly can. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's not a totally sane response either. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And um, I guess it comes back to, you know, your objectives and who your customer is and where they hang out online. What kind of content do they consume? Do they listen to podcasts? Do they read blogs? Um, do they prefer yeah. to download white papers and that sort of thing? And it's going to matter very much on the type of company you are and who your customers are. Yeah, I, I always tell folks, um, SEO is not for everyone, content is not for everyone, social is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. The thing that's right for you might be diff very different than what's right for another market, mm. another audience, or even one of your competitors, right? Because yeah. your strengths and your passions are going to be different from you know, uh, other companies in your space. And I think that marketing channels should be chosen based on what are your strengths and passions and what are your audience uh, actually paying attention to. Yeah, and that makes sense. And I like what you said there. Sometimes it's, you know, you've got companies with different strengths and passions, um, or your competitors may be blogging, or they may all be on social media, but hey, none of them are running a podcast. And podcasting, as you'd appreciate, is just blowing up. So if you can be the first to market in that industry or in that space, then you could get a foothold or on that yeah. beachhead, yeah. Absolutely. I think there's folks who I've seen uh, companies who've been successful with a piece of content every quarter mm. instead of a blog post every day. Wow. Uh, and I think that I think that that's a, a great approach to take. Right. To say, uh, what can we handle? What can we do and do well? What mm -hmm. can we do better than anyone else? Um, and what are we passionate about? What's actually going to reach our customers rather than, hey, content marketing is a big trend. Mm. Let's post, you know, put up 10 blog posts a day. That's, yeah, exactly. I think that's a terrible way to make a marketing decision. Yeah, and people need to, people and companies, I suppose, need to work out what works best for them. And um, it's the same with individuals. I know Seth Godin says the best business decision he ever made was to blog every day. But then you have guys like uh, Tim Ferriss who prefer to write one really, really long form piece, say once a month or so. So it just depends on what works for your audience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some, you know, some folks do a tremendous amount of content some folks uh some big brands do really really well with events and with uh you know celebrity influencers mm. and those sorts of things right and i don't think any of us would go to nike and say ah, i think you're do doing it wrong you know you should probably put up more blog posts that's yeah 
I don't think that's what they need. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I wanted to touch on social signals. Um, you know, social signals basically refer to what people are talking about online, and it's helpful in determining what content to publish um, and, and provide insights into what kinds of products maybe we should build. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how platforms like Twitter and, more importantly, Moz Content can help gather these valuable insights? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think the, the social networks in general have a few attributes uh, that are fascinating and useful for marketers. Uh, mm -hmm. Twitter is one of my favorites for a bunch of reasons, but mostly because it's so open, mm. right? Anyone can mine the data inside there. You can see information on everyone's profile. You can see all the updates that everyone posts. Mm. Uh, and for that, you know, I, I really love Twitter, uh, both as a marketer and as a content creator and sharer. It's a great place to find influencers as well. So even if, yeah. um, you know, for many businesses, they might say, hey, our audience isn't on Twitter. And my reply is often, okay, they're not. But what about the people who influence them? Mm. People who write the pieces that they read, the people who run the podcasts that yep. they uh, listen to, the people who uh, speak at the conferences and events that they go to, mm. are they on Twitter? And usually the answer is yes. Yep. Then I tell the brand, well, if you have the bandwidth and you can do it well, I would urge you to form connections uh, via Twitter. I, I think you know uh, Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and a lot of these other ones are more private, but you can still do a lot of great information mining. You mm. can certainly do some great competitive analysis by looking at what are your comp what is your competition you know, posting to these channels, mm -hmm. what's having success for them. A lot of those success metrics are publicly visible. I can see the likes and shares and comments on a Facebook post. I can see the you know, likes and comments on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I can see the follower counts as they grow. Uh, you know, I can see um, uh, with Snapchat, I can see the stories that are posted and the number of connections folks have. So there's, uh, there are metrics that will let you get competitive intel about mm. even the most private of social networks, yeah. uh, maybe with the exception of WhatsApp. Yeah. Pretty much everything else. Yeah, exactly. And so that's a, you know, that's a, another powerful way for businesses to do that investigation and to find out hey, is my audience on these channels? If you look and none of your competitors have any audience of any size and none of the influencers in your space have real big audiences on these platforms, well, maybe it's not worth investing there, mm. right? That could be a sign that it's not. But if you spot that, hey, there are a few influencers who are doing really well in our space on this channel, but none of our competitors are there yet, that might be a golden opportunity. Mm. Yeah, it uh, makes sense. That's terrific. Yeah, and also... You also asked... Yep. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you go for it. about Ma's content, which, um, let's see. So I would say when it comes to the world of social analysis, uh, if you're doing it for Twitter, Moz does have a product there called Follower Wonk mm -hmm. uh, that I'd certainly urge folks to yep. check out. A Great lot, product. A lot of people use and love that tool. Mm -hmm. A bunch of the functionality is free. Um, so that one might be great for doing quick Twitter analysis. Moz content is definitely more in the let me analyze my content against my competitors' mm -hmm. content. Mm. And I guess it also helps, um, if I'm not mistaken, determine what kind of content people are responding to as well. Um, you know, what should I be writing? What are people talking about that they may be may lend itself to an opportunity for content? Yeah, I think this is you know this is a great part of a content uh, audit or a content analysis project is to say what are all my competitors producing and what's having success for them, right? Because mm. I can go to my competition's blog or I can look at you know, the podcast they're putting out or the videos they've created on YouTube. I can look at, um, you know, what forms of social updates they're sending out and then say, now what's resonating, right? What's getting that engagement? What's getting the comments? What's getting the shares? All the emotional engagement. Mm -hmm. And from there, I can really get a sense of, okay, here's what's working in this field and here's what isn't. And that can, you know, that can and should inform a content strategy, um, discussion, right, and, a, and a, a project plan. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And um, I think we see a lot of startups, large companies, maybe just writing content for the sake of it because they yeah. think they need to be doing it, but not really doing enough due diligence up front to determine what should we be writing, where should we be distributing this content, because um, what's the point of spending two hours writing a blog if no one reads it? I, I couldn't have said it better. I, content creation is not the goal, mm -hmm. right? The goal is serving your audience and creating value for them in a way that makes them like you, know you, and trust you. Mm. Uh, and if you can do that with content, great. And if you're just shouting down an empty hallway, <laughs> why bother? Yeah, exactly. You can spend that time 
doing something else. Uh, <laughs> I mean, buy some ads, for God's sake. Right? Yeah. Like, at least you'll know that they've reached people. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It makes perfect sense. Um, so a question I like to pose to people in the marketing space is, if you're, say, using a platform like Moz um, to test particular marketing campaigns and say the numbers you're getting aren't overly encouraging, how do you know if it's because your product sucks, your marketing campaign is flawed, or maybe you just haven't spent enough time testing? Yeah, I think, uh, I, th I think from this perspective it comes down to being able to compare channels and projects against one another. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you say, hey, all of our channels are delivering traffic, but none of them are converting. Yeah. That sounds like a product problem. That's mm. not a marketing problem. That's a product or possibly a conversion rate optimization problem. Maybe mm. you have a terrible landing page, or maybe you have a bad reputation that you're dealing with in the industry, at least your product is. Uh, so, you know, I would address it that way. However, if you are seeing that Facebook ads work wonderfully for us, um, but Google ads are not working well, mm -hmm. Well, that is probably a marketing problem. That's probably you not bidding on the right keywords in the right places to the right audience with the right prices, right. with enough visibility, with the wrong messaging, you know, those kinds of things. And then I would say go audit your, your marketing campaigns and figure out what's, why it's working in one channel and not working in another because uh, clearly you are able to reach folks and convert them, just mm. not through this channel. Yeah, and I, I think um, it's critical that we apply different metrics at different stages of the customer journey. Um, for sure. You know, similar to uh, Dave McClure's uh, startup metrics for Pirates Funnel, um, and I think this applies very much so for large companies who think, well, what's the ROI on this marketing campaign as a whole, rather than, okay, how did we go getting them to our website? Um, what happened once they were on our website? Okay, they signed up to this list. Now, are they opening our emails? Are they coming back? Are they buying the products? Et cetera, et cetera. You need different metrics at different points of that funnel. Yeah, and I really encourage folks, um, you know, I, I have a Whiteboard Friday, a video that I did uh, on our website at the beginning of this year, I think mm -hmm. it was the, uh, the New Year's Eve one, in fact, uh, where I talk, where I show off how to build a metrics funnel, mm -hmm. right? Essentially, you build this, this funnel view, and then you apply, all right, brand awareness before people ever get to our site. What is our engagement on all these social networks? What right. does the branded search volume look like for our particular term or phrase? Um, you know, and what are people doing around our brand off our website before they get to us? And then there's sort of first visit, and there's the metrics around those. Where do they come from? How do they perform? Mm -hmm. There's another stage of the funnel, which is what I call, you know, kind of visits two through seven or two through eight, right? And uh, what are people doing in the middle of the funnel as they come back to us before they decide on that purchase decision? Mm -hmm. And then you go into sort of conversion and retention metrics, which most marketers are pretty familiar with. But I think having that full metrics view gives you a great way to say, hey, guess what? Next month is going to be kind of soft because the top of our funnel was weakening. Mm. Um, and that's something that not a lot of marketers, unfortunately, are investing in today, but I'd certainly urge folks to do. Yeah. So is that available on the Moz website? or? Yeah, it is. It's on, on the Moz website. You can find that, uh, that Whiteboard Friday. Uh, cool. Yeah, we'll, I'll have we'll a look for that, and I'll put that in the show notes. Um, so. Yeah, great. Cool. I think I'm done with the marketing questions, but I wanted to close out with a bit of fun rant. Um, so all this right. is some questions I pose of all my guests, a couple of hypotheticals and one on lifestyle design. So the first one is, if you weren't an entrepreneur, because <laughs> I've had people say, well, I wouldn't work for another company because I'm an entrepreneur, and you had to work for a company, um, yeah. which company would it be? And it could be at any stage of their life cycle. Ooh, man. Um... I really, I think I do pretty well at a company that was relatively early stage. I like small companies mm -hmm. kind of before they um, become before they blow bureaucratic. up. Bureaucratic. Sorry. Before they become all bureaucratic and slow moving. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I love that, like, you know, zero to forty person stage. Um, unfortunately, it's often the case that those companies are not tremendously well known. Mm. But um, yeah, there's uh, there's a cool company here in Seattle. I'm on the board of called Haiku Deck. It's just mm -hmm. uh, it's just four folks, and they're trying to disrupt PowerPoint, right? Like they want to make a better, easier, simpler version of how do we build 
slide decks and presentations. Uh, that's a pretty cool mission, and I, I love that size. I like the folks on the team. Mm -hmm. That would be compelling. Um, there's a nonprofit that I love called Give Directly. Right. Um, the idea behind them is they uh, they give money directly to poor people with no strings attached. Wow. Um, extremely poor folks, and there's a lot of people uh, who believe it doesn't work and who think it's a terrible idea, and you know they'll just go spend it on frivolous items. Mm. Uh, turns out all the re all that research is uh, in their favor, right? It it works phenomenally well. In fact, mm. it works better than the overwhelming majority of charitable projects to help people out of poverty. Um, yeah. Turns out, by and large, people are just pretty responsible. Mm. Uh, way more responsible than a lot of charitable organizations that try and help people. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I really, really like them too. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And actually, I um, interviewed Alex Tapscott, who wrote a book called uh, "The Blockchain Revolution" recently. And, oh yeah. And um, he was talking about how not-for-profits, or most not-for-profits, particularly in developing economies, are quite corrupt. And um, he told the story of how uh, money or fa foreign aid that was sent to um, Haiti. Um, yeah. Post the hurricane, which was supposed to go towards developing 130,000 homes, actually built uh, or well, resulted in the development of six homes. Um, yeah. yeah, just because of that, I suppose, lack of accountability. So, yeah, yeah definitely. It's real, it's real tough. Mm. Uh, I think charitable giving is very, very hard. Giving money directly to people who need it often gets it done, right? Because if you mm. don't have a house and you get a lot of money, you're going to go buy a house and someone's going to build it for you. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's how it goes. Yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. Question number two, Rand, is if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Ooh, boy. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is a tough one. Um, I like. <laughs> I think it would be. Uh, fascinating to understand some of the big um, moral and ethical decisions that, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm an American, right, and, yeah. and very interested in uh, Amer the American future. And I think America's future is, is weirdly politically tied to kind of this these few documents that were written, you know, 300 yeah. plus years ago by a bunch of slave owners. Mm -hmm. um, I would be very curious to ask uh, folks from that group, especially the folks who kind of structured and put together uh, the Constitution, why they specifically chose to uh, exclude people when their when their mission seemed so, uh, you know, specifically in this case, non-white landowners uh, who were you know non-white male landowners. Why why choose to exclude all of these other groups mm. in their supposedly inclusive mission? Mm. I think that's a I'm still challenged to understand. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a great, great response. And um, we get a lot of people, particularly your um, uh, fellow fellow Americans, saying they'd love to um, speak to Abraham Lincoln and ask him a question. So obviously from the same sort of um, era. Um, so finally, I ask all of my guests whether or not they have any rituals to help them stay on top of their games. And I know you've publicly stated that you went through some dark times a couple of years ago, um, but you bounced out of that to deliver heaps of keynotes, do, do a lot of traveling, and build a new product with Moz. And you know, I'm a big believer and advocate that life is about choice and the way you choose to respond to things. So I'd love to explore you know, the choice you made and what made it, motivated you to pull yourself out of that and what that transition looked like. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I stepped down as CEO uh, just about two years ago, uh, beginning of 2014, and uh, a big part of that decision was, you know, just that I had some real serious mental and emotional health problems, mm -hmm. um, and I think those were having a a very adversely negative effect on uh, the team here at Moz internally and on the business externally, uh, probably a little bit as well. Right. And so that. Um, you know, I think that was the right decision, but it was a very, it was a very painful one, right? Moz mm. is a company I founded. It's uh, very deeply tied to my personal identity. Um, you know, Moz is, is the, uh, outside of my wife, Geraldine, it's the, the only other really big thing in my life. And so uh, mm. that was, that was hard and challenging. I think the decision came about because I recognized um, that, being 
purely selfish and just wanting to say, I want this because I want it, not mm. because it's best for me to be in charge of this or not because I'm being the best CEO or the best leader that I can be, uh, uh, but I want to stay in charge because um, it's mine. Yeah. I should get to. Yeah. Right? I, I think anytime you're justifying things with that or like, I earned it, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, then you're making the wrong call, right? That's a That's coming from a selfish... Um, self-centered place and uh, you know I hope that I hope that in the future I can I can keep having the self-awareness and the recognition to to make calls like that mm. Uh, mm. that come from a, a humble place instead of a, a place of pride but I will say just because you know it's the right thing to do it doesn't make it any less painful yeah yeah, yeah. And I think that, that that statement resonates with a lot of um, our listeners, at, you know, definitely at one point or another of their lives. Um, but thanks so much for sharing that with us, um, Rand. I think our listeners will get a lot out of that. And um, you know, you're you're quite you seem like quite a fit, slick dude. Are there any like morning rituals, routines that you that you've got? Or? Well, you know, I have to curl this mustache. I know, man. How long does that take? That's a pain. I, I will tell you what. Um, <laughs> No, I do have uh, I do have one ritual that I stick to that I that I think is helpful, which is I've adopted sort of a a very slightly modified version of the inbox zero philosophy, mm -hmm. um, and that is essentially all communication and all tasks that I have to do throughout my day, every day, personal and professional, uh, they all come through my email or my calendar, or they don't exist. Yeah, I, I don't take phone calls. I you know don't check my voicemail. Uh, I don't look at my Facebook messages or LinkedIn or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not answering Snapchats. I try not to use Twitter DM. I just have everything funnel through these, you know, this this one uh, channel. And basically, if I can get to inbox zero, I know that I have free time. Awesome. I'm done. I'm good to go. And uh, and if it, you know, if there's a message in my inbox, I'm going to try and get out of there as fast as I can. So in the morning and at night, I have about an hour and a half in the morning, and usually four or five hours at night between about. 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. Uh, that I use to take care of all that communication and all the kind of work tasks I have. And that leaves my day free to, well, chat with wonderful folks like yourself mm -hmm. and to do all the meetings I hear for, have, have here at Moz and um, film my videos and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Love it. Love it. And I'm going to end on a light note. Um, you're known for wearing a pair of yellow pumas to a lot of industry events. Um, right. And I know you struggled to find a pair uh, recently. I think they've been discontinued. Um, have you managed to uh, find yourself some new pairs? Or You know, I saw these beautiful yellow Reeboks, and I was trying to decide oh, whether they Reebok. justify changing brand. Uh -huh. but, um, no, they, so it wasn't just that they were discontinued. I had a couple pairs, but one of them got stolen, so I only have one pair left. Ah. Well, I'm going to have to um, put the call out to our listeners. You know, if, if anyone has a pair of yellow Pumas in good condition, make sure to let me know. Uh, okay, it's, the, uh, it's the Mihara Yatsuhiros from 2007. Whoa. Uh, with the yellow cover. Okay. That's going to be really specific. I'm not sure we'll it be able to find there. that needle in the haystack. I have an eBay. You know, I only have an eBay account, basically, to keep track of whether <laughs> someone posts a pair of those in size eight and as soon as they do bam i'm on it uh, that's awesome man love it um so our audience can find out a little bit more about you at moz.com forward slash rand is there anywhere else they can go sure you're uh, welcome to tweet at me at randfish randfish too easy well thank you so much for your time today rand you've been an awesome guest and enjoy the rest of your night yeah you too see take care cheers well, that's it for my chat with Rand Fishkin from Moz. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. To find out a bit more about Moz, just head to moz.com. And if you're enjoying this podcast, we'd really appreciate if you took just a minute of your time to like us, share us, or subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. And to find out more about Collective Campus, the innovation school and consultancy base in Melbourne, simply head to collectivecamp.us. Until next time, Future Squared out.